Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to six player game, Ethnos, designed by Polly Mori and published by Simon Games. In the fantasy land of Ethnos, a new leader must emerge to unite the various members of the 12 tribes into a powerful alliance. You'll either become the new lord or lady of this golden age, or leave it to someone else to claim. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the middle of the table. There are special rules for setting up a two or three player game, which I'll discuss later, but here I'll show you the setup for four or more players. These are the glory tokens, and you'll want to shuffle them into a face down pile. Then draw three to place face up into the glory spaces of any one of the kingdoms, which are represented by these colored bordered regions. Just ensure the tokens are ordered from lowest value to highest going from left to right. Continue drawing three at a time until you've filled each kingdom's glory spaces. Each player now chooses one of the six possible colors and places these matching control markers in front of themselves. Around the outside edge of the board is a score track. Have each player put one of their markers on the zero space. In this video, I'm going to set up for four players. The deck with this art on the back are known as the tribe cards. Separate them into 12 decks, which you can distinguish based on the name found near the top, as well as their shared art. For example, these are all members of the dwarf tribe, even though their borders are made up of different colors. Into a separate deck, find and shuffle these 12 setup cards that all share this backing. Then deal six face up. These will tell you the six tribes that you'll use in the game. Leave those specific decks out, but all unused ones, as well as all of the setup cards, can now be returned to the box. In this way, each time you play the game, you'll use different combinations of tribes. The tribes you kept are now shuffled into a face-down allies deck, and then, depending on which ones you're using, you may also need to add some other components to the play area. If using the merfolk as we are, place this board nearby with the side face up showing the correct number of players. So in this case, we should have it flipped to this side. Then have each player put their markers on the zero space of this track. If the giants are a tribe you're using, put this token by the board, again with the side face up that also matches the number of players. We're also using the trolls, so these tokens are placed nearby, and I like to stack them in order from one through six. Finally, if the orcs are in play, give each player one of these boards to keep in front of them. When setting up for a game with two or three players, there are a couple of adjustments. First of all, before mixing the glory tokens, remove the tokens marked with a 4+. Plus. These you can return to the box, and then shuffle the rest of the tokens and place just two in each of the kingdoms. The final board might look something like this, with empty spaces in the third position, which is fine because in a two or three player game, you're only going to complete two of the ages. Also, in creating your allies deck from the setup cards only reveal five, meaning your allies deck will be made up of only five tribes, also making it a little bit smaller. And that's the setup. Now, in this video, I'm going to move several of the components off screen and then just bring them back in as necessary. That'll make things a little easier for me as I walk you through the steps of how to play this game. In Ethnos, you'll be collecting and then playing sets of cards in an effort to take control of the various kingdoms on the board, use special abilities, and gain glory. The player who has the most glory by the end of three gaming segments, known as ages, will be the winner. At the beginning of each age, there's three steps that you need to perform, so let's go back to the table and I'll show you how those work. First, have each player draw a card from this deck and add it to their hand. You can always examine your own cards, but don't let the other players see them. Next, from the deck, deal a number of cards face up equal to two times the number of players. I dealt eight since we have four players in this example. You'll now split the rest of the deck into roughly two equal parts. These three dragon cards are now shuffled into one of those halves, and then place the other half of the deck on top. In this way, the three dragons are mixed somewhere into the bottom of the deck, which you'll now place back beside the board. For the first age, choose the start player randomly. They'll take the first turn, and then play proceeds clockwise around and around the table until you get to the end of the age, which we'll learn about a little bit later. On your turn, you'll take one of two possible actions. 
The first option is to recruit allies. To do this, you either take any one of these face-up cards and add them to your hand, or you draw one blindly from the top of the deck. If you take a face-up card, you don't replace it. And that means it's possible for all of these to eventually be taken, so that when using the Recruit Allies action, you must draw from the top of the deck. We'll see how new face-up cards can be added back to this area to be drawn from a little bit later. As the game goes on, this deck will start to shrink, and if you would ever draw a dragon from it, you must immediately reveal it and place it beside the board. You may then draw a replacement from the deck, and assuming it's not another dragon, you can add that to your hand. The first two dragons that get drawn and revealed will have no impact on the game. They are simply a warning that the age is almost over. As soon as the third dragon is revealed, it is placed beside the player who drew it, and the age immediately ends. We'll see what happens at the end of an age a little bit later, but for now, let's go back to the player turns. On your turn, instead of using your action to recruit an ally and draw a single card, you may play a band of allies. In fact, if you start your turn with 10 cards already in your hand, you must play a band of allies, as you can never have more than 10 cards. When playing a band, you put in front of you either a group of cards from your hand that are all made up of the same tribe, like these three dwarves, or that all share the same border color, like these four blue cards. Each color also represents one of the six kingdoms found on the board. So, for example, all of the blue cards will have the kingdom name of Stratton on the top. A band can even be just a single card. This, however, would not be a valid band because it is neither all the same tribe or all the same color. Anytime you create a band, you must also select one of the cards from that group to place on top as the leader. So here I've chosen the orange dwarf as my leader. Now find the kingdom with the same colored border and name as your leader, and count how many of your control markers you already have there. In this case, we have zero. If the number of cards in the band you created is greater than your number of control markers there, you'll add a single new one. If our band had been made up of six dwarves, we would still only add a single token. Likewise, if we had just played a single dwarf to this band, that would also have been more than the number of markers we had had there, so we would have placed one marker in that case as well. If we want to add a new marker to this kingdom in the future, we'll now need to create a band of at least two cards with an orange one as leader. Here, we only have one of our tokens, but our band is larger than that, so we can add another control marker. Keep in mind, it doesn't matter how many tokens other players may have in that province, you only count your own tokens when checking to see if you've played enough cards in your band to add new control markers. You may play a band if it has fewer cards than necessary to place a marker, you'll just skip adding a new one to the board. When playing a band, you may also use your leader's ability, and each tribe has its own unique one. For example, if a wingfolk card is your leader, instead of having to place in the kingdom, that matches its border. It allows you to place a single control marker in any one kingdom where your cards are greater than your tokens there. But we'll look at how all the leader effects work a little bit later. Either way, after playing your band, if you have other cards remaining in your hand, you must discard all of them, face up into the area near the board where we first revealed cards. In this way, cards that you did not use end up being available to players on future turns to draw from. So it becomes quite important to consider which tribes you're making available to your opponents when creating your band. Anytime you create a band, always leave it face up in front of you in such a way that players can see how big the band was and which card was the leader. New bands you create should always be kept separate, but nearby the ones that you created earlier. So to summarize, on each of a player's turns, they will either recruit an ally or play a band. Until eventually, the third dragon is revealed, at which point the current age ends immediately. Now all players should discard any cards remaining in their hands, and then it's time to score glory. One by one, go through each of the six kingdoms. At the end of the first age, the player with the most control markers in a kingdom gains the points from the glory token marked 1. So here, white has the most control markers, and they would gain 2 points. 
If there are players tied for the most control, then divide the points among the tied players, rounding down. So in this case, both blue and white would get one point each. Keep track of points by moving the player's markers around the outside edge of the board. Now using the chart found here on the board, every player scores glory for each of the bands that they created during that age. For example, if I had created these three bands, the one here, with only one card, would earn me no points. Well, this one, with three cards, would earn me three points, and my band of five here would gain me ten points. Bands with six or more cards in them will score fifteen points. With that in mind, you can see why sometimes you might choose to play a larger band than is actually necessary to place one more control marker on the board, simply because those bigger bands provide more points. Also, depending on the tribes that you're using, you might have some other components around the board that can also provide you with points, but we'll learn how these work when we go over the different tribe abilities. Once the scoring is finished, it's time to start a new age. And although I'm only showing one player's components here, these rules of course apply to everyone at the table. If they're being used, both the giant and any troll tokens should be put back beside the board. That said, any control markers on the main board, as well as on the merfolk and orc boards, should stay where they are. Then all of the cards, including those in bands in front of each of the players, should be collected and shuffled into a face-down deck once more. Just like the start of the first age, you'll now deal one card to each player, and then reveal and lay out a number of cards face-up equal to twice the number of players. The three dragons are then shuffled into the bottom half of the deck. For the second and third age, the player with the least glory will be the first player to take a turn during that age. If there's a tie for least glory, as we have here, then the tied player who received the final dragon in the previous age, or who is closest to that player in clockwise order, becomes the new first player. The second and third age is played just like the first. However, when scoring the kingdoms at the end of the second age, the player with the most control gains the points on the marker in the second position, and the player with the second most glory there will score the points on the marker in the first position. In this case, white would gain six points and blue would gain two. The other player wouldn't gain anything. If there's a tie for control, the glory points for the tied players are added together and then divided equally rounding down. So in this case, white and blue would add together six and two, which equals eight, meaning they'd each get four points. The other player would still get nothing. At the end of the third age, the player with the most control would gain the points in the third position, second most would gain the points from the second position, and third most would gain the points from the first position. Again, with ties being resolved by combining points and dividing. So in this case, white and blue would add together eight and six for a total of 14 points, dividing it in half, giving each of them seven points, and the player here would then gain two points. After scoring the third age, the game ends, and the player with the most glory wins. If there's a tie, then the tied player with the most control markers on the main board wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the largest band of allies in the last age wins, then the second largest if necessary, and so on. Before we wrap up though, let's take a look at each of the 12 tribes and learn how their special abilities work. Keep in mind you only gain an ability from a card if it was played as the leader of your band. If you placed a control marker during the turn that your centaur was played as a leader, then you may immediately play another band of allies from your hand. This may help you add another control marker as well as use the new band leader's ability. After that, you would discard any remaining cards in hand to the face-up display as normal. If an elf was the leader of the band you played, instead of discarding any cards you didn't include in that band, you may keep a number of them in your hand equal to the number of cards in the band that you played. Anytime you see an X in an ability, this represents the number of cards in your band, including the leader. So after playing this band, if I had four cards left in hand, I could keep any three of them and would only have to discard one. When the Minotaur is your leader, you can count it as two cards for the purposes of placing a control marker. So if I wanted to place a new marker here, I would normally need at least three cards in my band, but with the Minotaur as leader, I only need two. With the Wing Folk as leader, as we saw earlier, you may place your control marker into any kingdom, so long as your band is big enough. 
In this case, with a band size of three, it means that we could place a control marker here in this purple kingdom, even though the band leader's color is orange. After playing a band with a wizard as the leader and discarding any remaining cards that you might have had in your hand, you may then draw a number of cards from the ally's deck equal to the size of the band that you played. So in this case, you'd get to draw three cards. Keeping in mind, these must all be drawn blindly from the face down ally's deck. Unlike the other tribes, there are twice as many halfling cards. However, when you choose one of them as your leader, you may never place a control marker on the board. A dwarf-led band still places control markers following the normal rules, but at the end of an age, you'll add one to the number of cards in the band when scoring it. So this band of four cards here is actually counted as five, which means I'd gain 10 points. However, this bonus only affects the scoring at the end of the age. When determining whether or not I can place a control marker, this band still counts as only four cards. Skeletons can never be the leader of a band, but they are considered wild, and that means you can include them in any band that you're creating. For example, I could add both of these to this band of green cards or to this band of wizards. They will also count towards the ability of your leader, so this means that I would get to draw five cards when using my wizard's ability, and they also count towards my band size when placing control markers. However, at the end of each age, all skeletons, wherever they are, must be discarded before you award glory based on the size of the bands that players have collected. If the leader of your band is a troll, then you may collect a single troll token with a value up to the number of cards in that band. Keep in mind, if a token you are owed has already been collected by a player, yourself or somebody else, then you would need to choose one of the lower valued tokens, if any. At the end of an age, when scoring kingdoms, if there's a tie for most control markers, first check to see if any of the tied players have troll tokens. The player with the highest total value in trolls will win that tie. In this example of a third age, instead of white and blue adding together the point values of 8 and 6 and then dividing them in half, blue wins the tie because of the trolls and gains 8 points while white only gains 6. If there's a tie for total troll values like we see here, then the player with the single highest value troll wins the tie. Each time you play a band with an orc as its leader, in addition to placing one of your markers on the map, if able, you also place one onto the empty space of this board that matches that leader's color. Keep in mind, each of these spaces can only contain a single token, so at most you can have six on the board at a time. At the end of an age during scoring, you may choose to remove all of the orcs from your board and then gain a number of points from this chart based on the number of markers you had here. In this case, if I removed my four tokens, I would gain 10 points. However, you may choose not to remove any orcs and continue to add to them during the next age if you wish. Just remember, each space can only hold one marker. So you may have a harder time adding new tokens in the next age, as in this example, I'd need to play either a blue or purple orc leader in order to add more tokens to this board. If you play a giant as a leader, check to see if you have just played the largest band for that age with a giant as leader. If so, then you collect this giant token, placing it on top of that band. You also immediately gain two glory. The next player who creates a larger band with a giant as leader, and that could even be the same player who already has possession of the token, then moves the token to that stack and claims two more points. At the end of an age, the player with the giant token also gains glory based on the age that just ended, as indicated here. So if this was the end of the second age, the player would gain four points. If Merfolk were the leader of your band, in addition to placing a control marker in a kingdom, if able, you then move your colored marker on this board a number of spaces equal to the cards in the band you just created. Anytime this would cause you to reach or pass a space with this symbol, you may then place a control marker in any kingdom no matter what size your band might have been. In this case, my band of three cards with a blue leader on top is larger than the number of my own markers in this blue region. So as normal, I can place a control marker here. Because the leader is a merfolk, I then move this marker three spaces as well, and it will land on one of these special symbols. That means I can then take another one of my markers and place it on any kingdom, even on top of this one, which has five markers already on it. At the end of each age, you'll score this board just like any other kingdom, assigning these points based on the age that you're currently in. 
Instead of measuring control here based on the number of tokens like you do in other kingdoms, you'll measure it based on their positions on this track. In other words, in the second age, the blue player would gain two points and the white player would gain one. Also keep in mind, this track does not reset at the end of an age, so you can keep building on it. However, if you reach the end of the track, your marker cannot be moved further. And that's how you play Ethnos. Now there are a couple of rule adjustments if you have a two or three player game, and I'll put those in the description of this video if you'd like to check them out. But otherwise, if you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.